In this video, I'm going to show you how to make fun kinetic type animations like this. Hi, I'm Adam Bennett. This is the video shop. There's a lot going on here. So rather than a step-by-step -step recreation, which will take f***ing forever, instead I'll break down these individual parts, as well as talking more generally about things that you should consider, such as guiding the eye, consistent stroke widths, using grids and guides, and a few other tips and tricks. Before we start, if you want to see exactly how I made any part of this animation, you can view the entire workflow on my sister channel, The Video Shop Longplay. I've chaptered each video, so it's easy to find a particular element, which is handy as it's over 30 hours long. Links for these three videos are in the description below, as well as the free project file. Okay, let's get started. We'll look at the inspiration for this animation shortly, but it was always going to have some kind of grid system. To make life easier when creating something like this, go into grid settings in grids and guides. This composition is HD, so to have a grid line, every 192 pixels splits the comp into a grid of 10 horizontally. Subdivisions will depend on how intricate your design is, but for this I had to. Then if you use the shortcut Shift plus the ampersand or apostrophe key, it will reveal your grid without having to go here every time. Turn on Snap to Grid in View, and then when you add lines for your design, they will snap to your grid. This is also really handy for any matte layers. In this project, I had them all at the bottom of my timeline stack like this, labeled, of course. By the way, thank you Adobe for track matte pick whipping. Next, let's set up a slider for our stroke. With this sort of design, it's important that all your stroke widths are consistent. If you have some which are off by just one or two pixels, it's gonna look wrong. But the more layers you have and the more complex the animation, the harder this is to maintain. Here's what you can do. Create a null, Regular viewers to this channel will know that I always give it the same name. And then add a slider control. Rename that slider stroke. Next, on any layer with a stroke, make sure the master scale property is showing. Then pick whip the stroke width to the slider control. Now, if we add this to the end, multiply, open square bracket, 100 divided by and then pick whip to the X or Y value of the scale. It doesn't matter which, but this does mean that you can't unconstrain the proportions of your scale. Then close square bracket. With this, not only can we control the stroke width all in one place, but if you want to animate the scale of your layer, you can do that without it affecting the stroke width. We can copy this stroke expression onto any layers in our scene, or duplicate any layers with that expression and adjust them. As you can see here in my final comp, every important design element is controlled this way. Obviously it doesn't look great when you bump it up this much, but it wasn't designed to. But around 2-4 to four pixels looks fine. And this is such a quick amend. Let's say you were doing something similar for a client, and they asked for the stroke width to be thicker. It's a last minute change, right before the deadline. But you hadn't set up a master slider control for the stroke. Whatever, it was a nightmare to work with. You can also do this with layers which are in pre-comps, or even multiple pre-comps. We'll get to this later. Let's look at how this animation evolved. As with most projects, I usually start by pulling an image reference together to create a mood board. I'll talk more about this process and mind mapping in my tutorial for tips for generating ideas in motion design. The process for this though was a bit of a shit show. I didn't really have a plan or brief. Pretty much just launched headfirst into it, which isn't a great way to work and means that you'll spend far longer figuring out your design as you go. Why am I been telling you this? You know this, you're not an idiot like me. Sometimes I use Illustrator, but not for this. Everything was created in After Effects, and I tend to work quicker that way, especially when I'm working with kinetic type. But if you want to create something similar to this, you might find it easier designing in Illustrator first. I wanted to create an animation which was meant to win students over to how amazing expressions are. So I started with a slider control named Progress and this percentage text. The idea was that everything in the animation would be controlled by the slider, a bit like this, which I use as an example when I teach expressions. Somewhere along the way, it evolved into a more general, fun, kinetic type thing with a vague theme of workflow. I was then going to use it as a thumbnail for this tutorial that I did on time remapping, but it was taking so long, I know, because I didn't plan it. So I created these After Effects interface elements, such as these buttons and the graph editor, and make it about time remapping instead. I kept returning to this mood board, and I'd say I was most influenced by this animation by Matt Voice for Adobe. I definitely wanted to see if I could recreate this text animation. We'll get to that in a second. I'll also these images. This one here was the starting point for the colour palette that I went with. 
as well as the look of the grid, and I also stole the look of the shadow on the text. Talking of colour palette, as with most of my projects, all the colours are expression controlled. Again, this can be potentially a huge time saver. It's pretty simple to set up, and I'll talk more about it in this tutorial. If you want to experiment with different colour palettes, I know there's scripts and plugins out there which will do something similar, but here's what I do. Duplicate the colours comp, and we'll call it V2, and then change the colours. Here's one I made earlier. Then to make sure we don't lose our original colours, I'm going to duplicate this comp again, and call it V1. Then copy and paste the colours from V2 into this comp. As long as the names of the layers are the same, it won't break any expressions. And we can see all the colours update in the master comp. Equally, if you wanted to animate a single colour, or all the colours, you can do it very quickly this way. The reason for having all these colours here was I was going to animate the cursor changing the colours. But at this point I'd spent over 30 hours on this and I needed my life back. Only joking, I have no life, I just watch films and occasionally do motion design. The technique for these letters I've covered in a separate tutorial. The catchily titled Extruded 3D Type with Stroke. Sorry I can't cover it here, but it's quite an involved process. I'll give you a quick overview and then you can decide if you want to bother watching it. All the elements are in a pre-comp called O1 Speed and each letter has its own pre-comp. Within that comp, all the layers are expression controlled by this one slider, which extrudes the text out up and to the right. Controversially, I went with a slight bevel on the face of the text, using layer styles with these settings. I used the same look here on the up and workflow type. It may not fit the flat color look of the animation, but I like it and it's my animation, so shut up. The bounce effect is done with time remapped keyframes, and I've added some glints on top. And there's layers for the shadow down here. But again, I go into all of that in much more detail in the tutorial. I like the idea of having arbitrarily different looks for the shadows. So some use this dots look, which is just this image that I found online, CC Repertile to expand it, and then set to Silhouette Luma here. And then some use these diagonal lines, which we'll look at later for these letters. Next up is up. This one's pretty simple. Each letter is animated in its own comp. So you've got this bouncing move on the Y axis, looped with the loop out expression. Then I pulled both letters into a new comp and offset in time by two frames. Then that comp is in this master composition called up. Quick word on workflow. I've labeled all the main text comps one to four up here so they're easy to find and access. Then all the less important pre comps are in folders here. So in this comp, fun drinking game idea, take a shot every time I say comp, actually you don't. So in this comp, I've pulled in this bounce up comp and added the tint effect to color it. Obviously this won't work if you want your text to be more than two colors, but it's fine for what we've got here. Equally, this could be a perfect job for essential graphics. Then these comps are also offset in time. The loop duration will always be whatever it is in this comp. So one second, four frames and we can see that it's the same in the main comp for these letters as well. Now there's quite a few pre-comps here, but because within each one I haven't adjusted the scale, it's always 100. The stroke widths of all the letters still update along with everything else. That's because I've expression linked their values to a slider on the main pre-comp in the master composition. I really hope you didn't start playing that drinking game. So as before, this is just a slider control and I've renamed it stroke. So back in our original letter comp, we've got... Actually, do you know what? Looking at this now, we don't need this control now. My fault, I didn't tidy this project before this tutorial. We can actually just have this expression directly on the stroke of the letter. So, I can delete that null. And then I'll do the same in the other comp as well. So this is the expression, linking to our master comp. Okay, so on our text layer, we have an expression on the stroke, which gives us a value of 4.3. By the way, this is a live text layer. I'm using terminal black type face, and I'm using layer styles for the stroke. So why have we got 4.3 here, when our master stroke is set to three? Well, here's the slider our up letters are referencing. The expression's the same as we used before, but we're using it on this slider instead of directly on a stroke width and it means we can scale up or down this pre-comp and it still works. 
So in this case, because the scale is 69, it's outputting a value of 4.35. Obviously, if any of these pre-comps are scaled up or down, it won't work properly. You can get around that by using multiple sliders or a more complicated expression, but that's not something we have time to go into here. Next up, let's look at this type. I wanted each word to be animated in a different way, which didn't quite work out as these two are basically the same, but at least this one is doing something different. It's pretty straightforward. I'd recommend finding a typeface with different weights, so you've got a reference like this. I use Dharma Gothic, which is an Adobe typeface. Then convert your type to shape layers and keyframe the mask paths. You can type path here, which will reveal them, which will save you endless untwirling. After that, you'll have to spend a bit of time shuffling vertex points and bezier handles. I won't dwell on this, as you can view the process at the end of the first workflow video if you want. I animated each morph over a second, just to keep it simple. So you've got the R here, then Y, O, U, then back to R so it loops. And over here I've got it animating in from the left. Note that apart from these keyframes where it animates on, all the other keyframes are linear. There's no ease in. That's because in the master comp I've time remapped it and done the ease in there. If you watch this tutorial, The Power of Time Remapping, you'll know this is a workflow technique I like to use depending on the project and what I'm animating. The shadow is just a line on a shape layer with a repeater. And I've used the set matte effect to use the text as an alpha matte. The alpha track matte here is set to one of these matte layers down here so that it all stays within the same box. If you use the set matte effect on a pre-comp like this, you'll need to check continuous rasterization, otherwise it won't work properly. Be careful though, as continuous rasterization could have a knock-on effect with anything within that comp. For example, if you're using mats or adjustment layers, and it would also mean you have to expression link your strokes differently. It's not something we have time to dig into properly here, but it will make sense if you download and unpack the free project file. And finally, we've got the transform effect to offset the position of the shadow off to the left. To make it a bit more engaging when it animates on, I've used this multicolor wipe comp. That's underneath the text, rotated and matted to the same box in the grid. Then I've used the same diagonal shadow lines, but without a mat, and wipe those on and off. And then finally the text and shadow layers sit on top. Now let's take a look at eye draw. This is also referred to as eye trace or guide in the eye. If this was just a looping animation, eye draw wouldn't be an issue as the viewer can just take things in in their own time. But if you animate the elements in like this, you need to consider how you're going to guide the viewer's eye to where you want them to look. Having a cursor or pointer on screen, clicking things is a great and easy way of doing this. And for this somewhat meta idea of animating an After Effects interface, it's thematically appropriate. At one point in the process, I experimented with having the cursor move around the whole grid, bringing elements on. If you ever want to do anything like this, here's a tip. Go to Window, Motion Sketch. Make sure wireframe and background are both checked. Pop this window off to one side or dock it, just so it's not in the way of the comp window. Here I've got our blank grid in the background, but if you wanted to work out the path of your cursor first, you could always do a really shitty drawing like this and have it in the background instead. Also, make sure you have enough time in your work area. If we try it here with just 12 frames, we get this. It just stops after those 12 frames. But we'll drag this out, and then it's gonna start where our playhead is. So we'll come back here. And then making sure your cursor or whatever it is you're animating is selected, we can draw our path. Because we had wireframe checked, we can see our path as we draw it on. I deliberately left the smoothing at one because we always have the option of refining it using the smoother. Just select the position keyframes you want to smooth and hit apply. Increasing the amount here will increase the smoothness and help reduce the number of vertex points. Whatever smoothing we apply, the speed will reflect how quickly we will draw in our cursor and in real time. We can see that here with the dots along the path. That's the great thing about motion sketch. You can slow down or speed up or even stop as you draw without having to manually get that timing right yourself. However, if you wanted easing at the start and end, say, you can always select the middle keyframes and set them to overcross time or any you wanted for that matter, if you want the cursor to pause in certain parts, it's up to you. 
Anyway, I did this because I wanted to see whether having the cursor move all around the grid and bring on all the text and other elements in one move would work, but it didn't, so I decided on this. I thought having just the After Effects logo on screen, you're immediately focusing the viewer's attention. There's nothing else there apart from the cursor. Then if the After Effects logo is central and we move it into place with the cursor, that's a good way to bring on all the grid elements in a nice way. And because we're keeping it monochrome, that's another way of keeping things simple. There's no colour or contrast in the scene fighting for our attention. So as the After Effects logo moves up here, our eyes are drawn to the left of the screen. We've got this pen here, but it's near the After Effects logo, so it's not an issue. We can pretty much take in both. Then, just a micro beat before, we click on the After Effects logo. As well as the cursor and logo scaling down and up slightly, accents like this dashed radial scale thing as we click helps pull the viewer's eyes back to where we want. Sometimes little touches like this can help accentuate key points. After that, we don't want everything animating at once. I was keen that the text should be read in order. Speed up your workflow. So we have this wave of color guiding our eye along the top here, then back down here so we read it up. And then I'm deliberately waiting a tiny beat before your comes on. Then we have enough time to read that before we come down here. And again, I deliberately use these brash multicolored wipes, which almost shout, hey, look over here. Yes, we have other elements animating as well, but crucially, they're not large or particularly distracting, so they're less likely to grab our eyes than the combination of the color and the large text we've got here. Plus, I made sure that all the important stuff was centered in the one by one frame. One thing which is an indulgence and might distract slightly is the pen movement here. But as I said before, it's on the left hand side of the screen and it made sense to have the pen roll on as the lines animated on and added a nice faux 3D touch. And I tried to time it so the pen stopped rolling pretty much before the other animation starts. So this is probably a good time to have a look at how that pen was done. As with most of the animation, I didn't really have a plan. I just thought it'd be cool to do a faux 3D rotation effect, but I didn't know how that was going to integrate into the animation as a whole. I grabbed some clip art or back on pens with varying qualities, but this one was pretty accurate and helpful. I traced it on a single shape layer with separate groups for the different elements. Then I recorded myself attempting to rotate my own Wacom pen without too jerky a movement. I used that as a reference for how the button looked when it rotated round. I only needed to do 90 degrees of rotation, so from the right round to the middle, because then I could take the pen, duplicate it, time reverse all the path animation keyframes, shift them along the timeline, and then scale that duplicate copy minus 100 on the x-axis to flip it then use that as a guide for the rest of the rotation of the pen. This ensured that the rotation timing was pretty constant and that the pen was perfectly symmetrical. I know I'm going very quickly over this process, but if it's of interest to you and you want to follow every step, we've got the workflow video. It's these chapters in the second video. To have it disappear behind the body of the pen and give the illusion of a faux 3D look, I duplicated the group with the button in and had one on top of the pen and one underneath. Then I keyframe the opacity with hold keyframes so that when the button is here, it switches from the top group to the bottom. Lastly, I duplicated the whole comp and made one color and kept the other one monochrome so that I could animate the color coming on here. And that's it for this tutorial. I hope you found it helpful. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.